mm-hmm. circumstances, this new guy come in, you like, oh, my D2 teammate, he really Division One, but he wasn't getting no burn, so he just went down a level. And now his shot attempts go from two, maybe three a game to 15, 16. Yeah. But he's still a Division One player. He just get Division One attempts at the Division Two level. Yeah. So it it, it was eye opening for me, bro. When I got to Valdosta, I'm like, this dude right here was supposed to go to Georgia Southern, Sydney, who was in Griffin, who was supposed to go Power Five out of high school, one of the top guards. He played with you. You know what I mean? Like, folks knew Sydney was that deal. Like, it, it, it's it's one of those things too, man. Where you're talking about like Division One, like it's everybody's goal. Mm-hmm. But as you get older and you start playing basketball, like you said, circumstances prevent certain people from getting to that level. Right. And it could be, you know, you playing on a stacked team, so you're not even getting noticed as much. Or you just, you know, you're not at a, at a right situation or school or, you know, place yeah. to be seen at the right time. Right. So dudes going to either NAIA, JUCO, and just different places. Because, like, when I went overseas and I started playing, I'm like – Yo, like, you can play, bro. Like, where you came from? I was in a little Juco out in, in Wichita, Kansas. What? Never heard of that. Why you didn't play? Yeah, then, then, you know, different circumstances. start. You start realizing different people's situations. So, right. yeah, man, it, it's crazy. I think for me coming out, I didn't have the, the understanding of the different levels. Right. Like, all I knew was go to a Division One school. And then, like, the JUCO and Division Two, like, I didn't – nobody had sat me down and explained it to me. So when I realized, like, I didn't do what I was supposed to do right. for the Division One schools that was, you know, knocking at my door, then it was kind of like when North Georgia came, which was a good Division Two, that I know that now, right. I was like, I mean, it's a military school. What am I supposed to do? Right. I, don't, I don't know what to do. So I – opted to go JUCO and I didn't have to right. because nobody explained to me what a division two was. Right. So like you said, like it's right. levels to it, but nobody explained, you know, what was supposed what, to happen. What is what? So, and we still, we still lack that to this day. Like as far as just having more people that played at that level to come back down and talk to the kids about, cause it's still now it's a stigma where it's uh, division one or bus. And we all, played against division one you played at the division one level so we know what it takes and we don't see what it takes in about 90 to 95 percent of the kids that we run up on and it's like dude if you think you division one and then you run up on a aj you run up on a boozer twin you run up on these kids i rather you kind of know before you run up on them then when you see them and then it just destroys your confidence because that's what those guys are going to do they come out every day looking to destroy whatever's in front of them that's always been their thought process yeah and that's why they're the best of the best because they don't care who's in front where it's a grown man a five-year-old kid a girl a grandma they trying to get 30 (laughs) and 15 every single time and you got to have that mindset you kind of got to be thrown off it's kind of like how they say about being a football player at the next level, you got to be kind of throw it off in the head nah, for sure. to be the best of the best. And it's the same thing with basketball. Sure. Like you got to be an insane human being to wake up at four in the morning to lift weights, get up shots, go to school, um, shoot during PE, practice, and then shoot after. You got to be insane, bro, to you, do stuff like you, that. You, you got to be you got to be crazy like that because man, like you know, like just the different dudes I've seen coming up and just like. From like me playing to coaching, it's like they just they're different. Right. You know what I mean? Like just their mindset on how much they want to get in the gym and work, when they're gonna work, they're not gonna let any other obstacle prevent them from, you know, doing what they need to do to get better. Like I remember back in college, bro, like like Chunk. Like <laughs> he was like, yo, what we doing today? I'm like, all right, cool. It's Saturday night, about like eight, nine o'clock. He's like, yo, if we gonna go out. I'm cool with going out, but let's go to the gym. Let's go get some shots up. That's he my that's, that's he my shumper, by the way, right? Yes. Yeah, you gotta let the viewers know. So it's just like he was he he was so throw it off. Like he was so intentional with trying to get better and always beat whoever was in front of him to the point where 
he would do that before he even had his fun. Right. You know what I mean? Like we would go to the gym, work out, shoot, play one-on-ones, just do whatever in the gym. And then by 10, 11 o'clock at night, like we done, we take a shower in the gym and we go out to where we got to go. You know what I mean? And just like now that's where, why he was a pro and he ended up playing with LeBron and Carmelo and he just found his carved his rose out, you know what I mean? For many years. But like I said, man, you got to be mentally thrown and just kind of just, think differently from everybody else to kind of get to where you need to get to. Quick thing, Sean, tell, tell, tell the story about that open gym that time when Shunt was in the building, when it was at Tech. Man. <laughs> cut, cut, sit, cut, sit, don't Hey, <laughs> I'm barely six foot. So for one, I'm on the floor. My whole thought process is just be solid. Right. Everybody in there play oversee pro somewhere, and then there's me. Like, I'm not one of those, but I'm a, I'm a decent basketball player. Right. And so he naturally plays the one. I'm a one. He on the other side. My whole thought process, the whole time I've been playing ball is, I don't care who in front of me, do what you got to do. I'm coming up court. When 6'5", sit down and spread them eagles, spread them wings, I'm talking low to the ground, lower than I was. And I'm like, God damn. Like, <laughs> and this nigga strong. I'm like, well, that's that's the difference we talked about. The right. difference in the levels. Right. Like, this nigga's about to get ready to go get drafted and be a pro. And I got some work to do. Right. Because at the same time, like, I'm still going through my basketball journey at the same time. I'm like, shit, I got to take this back with me. I need to get back in somebody's gym right. and work. But we got a nigga who sit down 6'5", in a wingspan, 6'9", like 6'10". And, and he they, enjoy playing defense too. Yeah. Like he'll they want to play defense, want to defend, and want to get stops. Yeah, he'll go to an open run and like he might not even shoot. Just cool. He's just you. gonna just lock up. Stop you. He's just gonna lock up. Just want to stop you. That's all I want to do. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, Lance, with you know you playing at Georgia Tech and you know being there for four years, you play with some play with some guys. You know you play with some do. really high level guys. Who would you say? Um, it's a two. It's a two part question. Who do you think was your most important teammate, and who do you think was the best teammate? I'm gonna put you on the spot. Hmm. You said my most important teammate. Yeah, it can be a vet. It can be somebody that kind of helped you um, change some bad habits. Somebody that you kind of learned something <laughs> from and stole from, or you know, just something like uh, that. Uh, I mean, my freshman year. Um, I had uh, Jeremy Smith, right? And crazy thing about it, like, Jeremy was one of my guys in my wedding, man. And and the reason on why is because, like, I was – he was a senior. Mm-hmm. I was a freshman. And he had took in two other freshmen, which is myself, Ghani, and Mo Miller. Right. And, you know, him being a senior, taking in three underclassmen or freshmen is, like, big. Like, you know, like, man, I got to deal with these young dudes and – you know, he just showed me the ropes, man. Just showed me like how to maneuver, you know, with school, with playing, with just being being social in the city, you know, especially in Atlanta, Georgia Tech, you know. You know, it's a lot of things going on, but you know, he just kinda helped me just understand what's my purpose and why I'm here. And the main thing was to, to play basketball at a high level and then just also get my degree. You know what I mean? And whatever you do from there, that's on you, especially with the sports wise. So I would think that would be my most uh important player that I had at tech and then my best. When you say best, what do you mean by best? Like not what they did at the next level. Just when you was at tech, you was like, oh yeah, he the one. He the one. That's that's I ain't never seen nothing like this. I probably ain't gonna never see nothing like this again. He the one. And at the time now, tech was the school that was point guard you that was forward you like I, y'all had some of the so, best of okay the best. so cool so all right so also i go back to like you know of course we had the Derek favors you had iman like you know what i'm saying even younger than me coming up you had like mufon and, and and uh glenn rice but when i say the best is for wise like what i did was anthony morrow okay like Anthony Morrow, dog, we would have workouts, and uh, I remember CY was, uh, he was always really big in skill development, and he was just like, all right, we're going to get our shots up, 
Seven spots, five shots. Let's go. Let's go. And he used to always say who had the best of the day because we used to come in like segments throughout the morning. Mm -hmm. And he was like, all right. He said, the number to beat, 33 for 35. Jesus. 33 for 35. From three. From three. Jesus. And I'm and it ain't no just one ball, get the rebound. You, it's two, three balls. Like, so you they take your be. shot. Like, yeah, you come in and you going around the horn, getting your shots up. And I'm like, you know, at the end of the day, man, like that was kind of like me being a, a freshman. That's kind of discouraging in a way where it's like you coming in, your number to beat is 33 for 35. That means my first two shots going to probably be misses. I'm trying to get loose. That's right. a tough act to follow, though. That's a tough act to follow. But I mean, but it was also an eye opening to let you know, like me being a freshman, like, oh, like this is what you got to be. Mm -hmm. And my whole thing is like Amo wasn't even drafted like I, if I'm not mistaken, Amo made it through summer league right. and got signed and ended up having a long career. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But he, like, we talked about those guys just being different and just throw it off. Like, he was one of them dudes. Like, there was times where he would miss two or three shots in the in the game or in practice, and he's, like, pounding at his head. It's like, you know, make a shot. What you doing? Right. And it's like, you know, I wasn't doing that. You know what I mean? But, like, that's why he – is where he's at because he was just a little bit different from everybody else. So that would be my 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 best, you know, just for what I was looking at what I had back in the day. So, Sean, you said you were at North Georgia, correct? Yes, sir. But you also played at Georgia Perimeter prior to North Georgia. So I'm going to open up the question a little bit broader for you. You can go back high school, JUCO, or North Georgia. Who was the most important teammate you had during those three stops? And who was the best teammate uh, as far as talent during those three stops? The best teammate, talent-wise, George Brimley, Vincent Banks. Legend. Hmm. Legend. He's, he's up there at the top coming through the state of Georgia. Um, I think people don't really give him as much credit as he deserves. Right. Um, you know, because of some certain things that took place, yeah. certain situation, but he could go flat out. Like he was one of the first players that I actually realized, and even just in college at the junior college level, was like, he's a pro. Right. Like I'm watching him as a defender. I'm watching everything he does, all the small stuff, the toe taps. You know, pick a spot, get to it, get your shot off. Mind you, I'm 19. Right. I'm a sophomore, and I'm like, why is he doing this? Right. And even even after that, seeing Jay Crowder come through, seeing mm -hmm. Jay Crowder play, you know, the next year as a freshman, right? And that was baby Brown to that that uh that whole division that conference. You know, it was tough. Um, probably one of the most important teammates for me. Probably one of my teammates, Brody Langston. Okay. Um, he was at Georgia Premier with me. He was actually the reason why I ended up at North Georgia too. Okay. Um, he had went through. He from East Hall. He had went through some spells where he broke his leg, kept breaking his leg like two or three times. So he was played by injury, but man, it was just always just, he was a year older than me, but he always, you know, gave me the game, you know, kept me motivated when things weren't going right. right. And even my situation where I was sitting out, when he gave me the phone call, he was like, you know, what you got going on? Right. Like, they want you. Like, well, well, I need to put you through the coach. And so. I always give him credit for that and thank him for that. Though. But, yeah, definitely one of my most important teammates. Yeah. What, what, what about you, uh, Coach Mike? What, what's your best and most important uh, player that you play with and helps you and kind of showed you, like, what's going on? I, I'm going to start with the most important. Uh, it was a guy, so it was at Valdosta State, this guy by the name of Charles Belton. Oh. So he played at Fayette County High School, um, graduated in 05, played at Rice, and he transferred over to um, Valdosta my freshman year. Just a just a great dude, right? Like he just, he comes in, he works hard. Uh, he don't go out, he don't smoke, he don't drink. He don't do nothing. Dude just hoop, carry himself a certain way. And he go home and he, he makes sure 4.0 GPA, all that. So, you know, as a freshman, I'm the that year that was the best team that Valdosta State has ever had. We went 29 and 5, 
went to Elite Eight, uh, first time in school history, won the region. We won, Cam uh, uh, forgot our Gulf South. We won the Gulf South Conference mm -hmm. that year. So, like, we made a lot of noise that year. And I was the only freshman. So, you know, I'm running around. I'm smelling myself, you know. All the other freshmen, <laughs> mind you, I came in as a walk-on. So, some stuff happened at a JUCO that I was at a couple months prior. And uh, the coach got fired who recruited me. So, I had to go home for a semester and I just trained and then um I got a call from my buddy Steph and he was like hey man they have a workouts down here at Val Austin and they got some high school kids coming um I think you should come and I was like eh they ain't gonna like is the coach really gonna be there like you know what I mean you know how yeah. the fluff be mm -hmm. you're like nah like hell for gonna be there like come in and do you so I went down the first workout murdered it so they like, well, who is that dude? So the best player on the team ended up taking me up under his wing. So we went out. We went to uh, Zacadoo's, uh, and we went to other different spots around the city. They was treating me like I was on the visit, and I just came to work out. So then I got a call from the coach, and he said, hey, um, we want to bring you back down for an official workout, official visit. Mm -hmm. So it's just going to be the team, and you're going to be the only guy. So I went down there and them dudes was treating me with so much love. And he was one of the main ones that, because we from the city, yeah, he was the one like, hey, like come hang with me. You know, we going to do da, 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 da. Come to find out we knew similar people back home because his brother uh, plays with Mike Crane and Rip mm -hmm. and uh, John Rogers, those dudes that played in the program back in the day. His brother used to hang with them. So it's really a small basketball circle. So me and him hit it off right away. So every time I look like I'm about to make a bad decision, he'll pull me and be like, nah, that ain't that ain't, ain't the move. move. We yeah. need to we need to do this. We need to do that. Like you need to take advantage of what you got going on because Helfer don't like freshmen. When he recruit, he re recruit JUCOs and transfers. He don't want no true freshmen mm -hmm. because they can't help him right away. So if he sees right now that you're – a true freshman and you're dressing and playing, he sees value in you. So you need to understand the moment that you have and you need to take full advantage of it because he also told me too, like, hell for get rid of niggas too. Like he cut them. He's not a, a player's coach. He don't really care about what you got going on off the court. You know what I mean? Like what goes on in the inner city. Yeah. He wants you to win ball games and All that's reason. it. You know, and that's and that's when I learned about the business of college athletics. Like, this scholarship is only for one year. And I need you to <laughs> uphold your part of this scholarship or I'm going to take a piece of it or I'm going to take it all the way. No, nah, for sure. So uh, Chuck was the guy who gave me that game, and that's my dog still to this day. And uh, the best and most talented teammate. So I went to Patterson Prep up in Lenore, North Carolina. It was a dude by the name of uh, Courtney Forreston. Courtney Forreston, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who yeah. played at uh, Arkansas and got drafted by the Houston Rockets and uh, played for the Clippers, and now he's playing over there in China. I've never seen somebody at the 5'9", 5'10", make an impact on the game like him ever. Like, when you see him play – prototypical stereotype you see a dread head he'll crash out he finna just go out he just gonna play hard on defense he just gonna be you know what yeah. i mean he gonna have that pat bell no nah, he was skilled yeah you know i mean you don't really see dread heads that's like coming out that can knock a jumper down that mm -hmm. freakishly athletic with it like they coordinated and when i seen c4 play for the first time in pickup dude was so strong he plays so low to the ground and when i say Dude was so athletic. I'm talking about 40, 41, 42 inch vertical. He windmilling. He going between his legs. He 360 and backwards. Did with no training now. No Vertimax. Like, cuz ain't really lifting. He oh, just got man. that strong Alabama country athleticism. And when I seen dude, and then so I'm like, all right, let me see how he is in game mode. So we always used to have a preseason game against uh, Oak Hill. Because oh, where my school is at, um, it's a mountain that separates North Carolina and Virginia. Yeah. And on our side of the mountain is Patterson. On the opposite side of the mountain 
is old kid. So we would play each other in preseason every year. And they had Brandon Jennings that year. And, you know, Brandon Jennings, number one player in the country. Uh, that dude. You know what I mean? At the time, he was – everybody was saying he's going to Arizona, this, is that, and the four. But he was the guy in high school basketball that year. And I'm like, that nigga finna kill us, bro. Because the year before, I seen Oak Hill play – who Oak Hill played that time at Tech when they had Nolan Smith? Was uh, that Wheeler? No, they played uh, North Cross. North Cross. Because we so, played uh, Wheeler the game before. So mm -hmm. at that time, I seen Brandon Jennings play mm -hmm. at Tech. So I remember I came home just for that. And I'm looking, I'm like, Nolan Smith like a pro. Like, he don't really do a lot of flashy stuff. But Efficient. you look at the box score. Efficient. Seven for ten. Uh, he don't went to the line four or five times. He got 30. Could might not even sweat it for real. Brandon Jennings out there wilding, throwing it off the glass, <laughs> uh, going double between the legs. Like he might even do a, no you know what I mean? He might do some no looks. He doing a spin move on the ground. Like it's NBA street with him. And it's hard to game plan for somebody that you don't know what they're going to do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So Nolan Smith at Duke now. So Brandon Jennings can do whatever he wants to. So me, boy, I'm like, I ain't played against somebody that caliber since. Derrick Rose and Eric Blesso on the AAU circuit. And I ain't have to guard them niggas, thank God. <laughs> because what they did to my teammates, I wouldn't wish it on any basketball player. Yeah. So <laughs> when I when C4 had the matchup, so we going through the scout report. And we're super talented now. We got Darius Johnson Odom, who played at Marquette with Jimmy Butler. We got Nate uh, Miles at the time. Nate was, Nate going, Miles. Oh, he was supposed to go to UConn. 6'6", six, six, uh, PG. So... We had some we had some dogs. Cam Joyce was on that team. Cam mm, who played at uh yeah. played at St. Vincent St. Mary. So we had some dudes, Chris Capetz, uh, who played at Cedar Shows. Mm -hmm. Um, Matt Simpkins, who ended up going to Memphis, played for John Calipari. We had a squad, but it's still the number one player in the country. So I don't know what's gonna happen. So me at this time, you know, I'm like the third point guard on the depth chart. Nigga ain't getting in. <laughs> so I'm just there to enjoy the show. <laughs> so uh, Brandon Jennings walk in. Nigga don't stretch. Typical Hollywood stuff that a high level guy does. He just come in and he get up a couple shots. He might miss every single shot, but I ain't going for it. I already know how you get down, boy. You can miss every shot in warm ups. You gonna make every one once the game start. Mm -hmm. What a nigga Courtney was locked in. When I say when that ball tipped off, boy, well, he picked that nigga up. As soon as that inbound came, and I'm talking about mm -hmm. he made life hell for dude, dog. I'm talking about Brandon Jennings. That was the first time I ever seen Brandon Jennings come down to earth. That was the first time I ever was like, okay, why aren't, why isn't Courtney in the same conversation as a Brandon Jennings? And it goes back to what you said earlier about the resources. So he went to a pretty solid high school in Alabama, but it's Alabama. You know what I mean? So, like, it's only so far you can reach mm -hmm. to get to the masses when sure. you come from those smaller cities and states where it's not a lot of resources, it's not a lot of viewership. And, you know, it's not like now where you can upload a Baller's Life mixtape and you can be, like you said, Wichita, Kansas, or Cooper Flagg, who's in Maine. Like, who would ever think now that Maine, the yeah, best player in the world is from Maine. Yeah. So um, when I saw Courtney for the first time compete, and by the way, we ended up winning that game against Oak Hill. It was a three-part scrimmage. Uh, we won the first game. They won the second. We won the third. They didn't put it in the newspaper because at that time, Oak Hill was smacking everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, we ended up winning that game. So Courtney Forson was and is the best player that I've ever play with and, mm. and he's still playing to this day like he's in china right now in the cba he was in russia for a little minute like i said he played it with the houston rockets played with the clippers and you know another good dude too like you know what i mean he's just a genuine um brother who just he just loved to go out and compete yeah and he always he was the one that taught me about compete you know everything you do mike you want to win it i don't care if it's the first to get to the front of the line for sprints or 
to demonstrate a drill, the fact that you are the first shows that you're not afraid to mess up. And I try and encourage kids now, you know, that I coach, like, don't be afraid to mess up because at some point, if you just keep trying, eventually you're going to get it. But if you don't um, jump off that porch and try and make some things happen, then, uh, you know, it's hard to um, face adversity when it's time for you to face adversity. For sure. Let me ask y'all a question real quick. You threw out something. You said the word compete. How do you think the the kids now, they factor in competing, not just with basketball, but in sports in general? Because like you said, we're all around. We're around the game every day. Right. We see kids every day. How do you feel the kids compete nowadays? Right. Uh, I mean, I... I, I think they they compete in some type of form or fashion, but you know they don't. They'll compete, but I feel like majority of them, if they don't win, they just brush it off. It's okay sometimes, you know what I'm saying? Like I uh, I got tomorrow to do it. Whereas I feel like you know a lot of dudes, or when I was coming up, it was like a if I lost, I'm over. Like no 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 no, we gonna run it back. Yeah, run it back. I'm gonna keep running back until I finally win. You know what I mean? I don't really see that too much nowadays with some kids. Some kids got it. You know what I mean? Or I feel like some kids have it to the point where they don't they don't express it the right way. You know what I mean? Some kids a uh, uh, storm off or get mad or you know whatever the case may be. And instead of them trying to fight and continue to compete and try to win, they are just they do other things. You know, but it, but it also goes back to like you know. I don't see too many kids outside in the street anymore. You know what I mean? Like, that's how you learn how to really compete. You know what I mean? Like, I remember when we was, I, I don't see kids in the, in the cul-de-sac on the basketball goal shooting. I remember when I was younger, I used to have a, me and some of my, you know what I'm saying, friends who walk around the neighborhoods find, with a basketball, I'm walking, putting the ball through my legs, how many times I can do it without messing up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Then I'm like, oh, I got 30. Your turn. All right. You know what I'm saying? So, like, it's just different. I think the ways these kids compete or it's, it's different from how we came up. And I think that's just, you know, of course, us as coaches now, like, that's what we have to adjust our mindset of how they compete and what's their mindset in. Like, we got we can't think like how we think anymore. We got to think like how they think and figure out a way to Bridge make it, yeah, put, yeah, make it balance out for my understanding and them to do a little bit more when it's come to competing. So, I think a lot of coaches too. When we were coming up, they didn't want to conform to what was taking place. You know, the game was changing and evolving, and our coaches they were still pushing. You know, the old school. Like, and us now being coaches, going through that, I think now we had to realize like, okay, some of this stuff we may not like it or, you know, want it to be a part of the game, but it is part of the game. Right. And I think there's some people still struggling with that. What's some what's some things though that you think that is outdated that people aren't adjusting to with the new style of basketball? Camera for one. Uh, the kids nowadays, everything is flash. They right. just gotta be seen. It's like you say, you can upload a video and it go three sixty around the world right. in zero point how many seconds? Right. So when we was coming up, we didn't have that. You couldn't, you know, go out, go in the gym and get the pickup games recorded. Right. And then, you know, you go by the time you get home, the whole world and seen. Right. And then it's seen you get buckets on somebody. Right. So with the kids now, it's like they can't do it if they're not doing it in front of the camera. And I think that's kind of it's kind of detrimental when they come in the gym because they're not putting in the real work. And I mean it's a lot of factors that go in and that avenue could go down a lot of different places as far as when the kids are actually working out and who's training them and all that stuff. So you know. That camera can also be dangerous too because you got kids now who they don't want to guard no more because in fear get of getting getting embarrassed or they don't want to go for a block attempt because they might get dunked on. But they go back to competing. It goes back to competing. I mean, if you're gonna compete with the lights off, you gotta compete with the lights on too. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? All right. I one, one thing for me when I was coming up, when I was playing high school, college, AU. I always wanted to win my matchup night in and night out. Absolutely. I don't care who was stepping on the floor in front of me. My whole objective was I didn't want to get scored on. Right. I did, I did not want nobody to be able to 
have the opportunity to say, I gave him buckets. Right. Now there's there's some guys out there who, you know, kinda they had they got the best of me, had some good games. Most of them guys, like, they were pros. Right. But at the same time, you didn't back down. Was, yeah. I'm I'm competing. That go back to that story in tech. Like right. I'm out here, this is what I asked for. Right. So, you know, I had some moments, good stops or whatever, you know, going through. But at the end of the day, I looked at it like this. This guy's about to be a pro. Right. I'm using this measuring stick. I'm here in the game. It's five on five. It's ten people on the floor. Whether I'm eight, nine, or ten, I don't have to be one, two, and three, but I'm in the mix. Because there's some guys sitting on the sideline who not out here and who not gonna get out here. But mm. I'm one of the people out here, so I'm doing something right. So I'm gonna build on that and I'm gonna take that everywhere I go. Right. So So Coach Lance, um we asked about who was your best teammate and your most talented teammate. Now we're going to flip it on the coaching side. What's Who is the best player that you've ever coached? And who do you think was the most, we can say, the kid that made you fall in love with coaching during your tenure of coaching? So, the, I mean, the, it's a no-brainer. I, I was I had the luxury of coaching Anthony Edwards for a year at Holy Spirit. Um, my my guy Ty, who I played ball with at Tech, was the head coach, and he gave me a call and was like, "Man, like, I want you to come and help me out this year." You know, what I mean, first year for me, and I was like, "All right, cool." And then he started running down a lot of guys that you know. He would, you know, that they had on the team. And then, you know, he, the last name he said was Anthony Edwards. And I was like, why is that the last name you mentioned? Right. And he was like, I mean, of course, you know, once I said his name, it's a no brainer, but I want to let you know how many other, you know, solid guys we have. I'm like, all right, cool. But when I'm looking at Ant just play and move, it was just different. Right. You know what I mean? Like, it was just different. Like, he just, he, he had a routine. He'd come in, he'd get his form shooting up. You know what I mean? He had a certain, you know, ball handling, you know, moves that he wanted to get into his shot. You know, he focused on a lot of just, you know, coming off a of pick and roll, one, two dribbles, like, from the NBA range in high school mm -hmm. already. And, and a lot of people, you know, I don't know, he ended up reclassing up. To go like, to college. To go to college yeah, early. I remember that. And it was a thing where, like, personally, like, a lot of people was just like, man, I don't know if, if he, you know what I'm saying? Like, how well does he compete? Does he love it? And I'm like, the kid loves it. You know what I mean? I just think it just got too easy for him. It just the challenge wasn't there anymore. And he needed a new challenge. Right. You know what I mean? And, I mean, and it's hard to, you know, in in a, in a sense, you're like, oh, man, you know, like, you got to. You can't care about where you at. You got to do it regardless, you know, where you at. But it's like in the sense where if it's if it's not pushing you and challenging you, you're always going to look for the next thing. So that's what he did. And like I said, he, he he just competed, man. He was just a dog. And it was times where, like, you know, I remember in games, like, they'd be like, yo, aunt, you know what I'm saying? Like, Ty'd be like, yo, you got this matchup, right? Probably like the third best, fourth best guy on the team, you know. And, and you know, guys would be like, man, we're trying to – you know, save his energy so he can be ready for offense. And, you know, he'll get, he'll be sleep, help side, looking at the ball, throw a backdoor pass, layup. He get burnt. You know what I mean? A couple times. And I'm just like, man, like, instead of telling him to guard this guy because of this, what he does, like, tell him to guard the best player. Keep him engaged. Keep him engaged. Just tell him, like, oh, what does he do? He's the best player. He's the offensive threat. Stop him. Mano y mano. Because the game's all about matchups. Right. You know what I'm saying? So why let a kid that talented, you know what I'm saying, just kind of have to worry about other things where, like, let him be more engaged throughout, you know what I'm saying, just in that now you see in the league. Like, he, Bro, he, he's, one, he's one of the best two-way guys in the league right now. Right. And that was because he always wanted that challenge. Like, I'm good. You're good. Let's see who's going to be best right now. And, like, that was by far, like, he's the best kid that I've coached. You know what I mean? And I've coached a lot of talented dudes, man. And, you know, just but just from the mindset and how much he worked, you know what I mean? He would practice and leave to go to the gym over there, you know what I'm saying, in College Park. 
and be working out at 11 o'clock at night after practice. Mm. So goes back to that. Uh, Got to be wired psychic. different. Got to be wired differently, man. Yeah. And what was the kid that uh that made you fall in love with coaching? Is there a specific player? Uh, it could be that it could be that six year old that made a layup for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> man, I had a I had a cold when I first got into coaching, man. I had a cold little you know second grade team. We was up under DCA, um, you know Kevin Savage. It was his program, and my pops was the one who was like basically kind of begged me, like, man, come on, dog, it's fun. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like give back to he sell, he's selling. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> he's selling. He, he did. Yeah, he did. Like I, I like to be honest, dog. I really, I thought about coaching when I got done, but I just wasn't sold on it. And I'm like second grade kids, like come on, man. But he was like, come on, man. Like it's easy. You can just kind of get your feet wet. Mm -hmm. But them kids were cold, right? You know what I'm saying? Like I had a kid, and I had Chance and and Langston and CJ and Zay. I had a man, and we ended up. Coming like top four, top five in the country for like two years in a row, second, third grade. And those kids helped me love to coach and want to see kids get better. And just seeing where they were at from day one to like, you know what I'm saying, when I finally finished coaching them was like night and day. Right. And, you know, that's just kind of how I got into it and when I just loved it. And those those the kids that, you know, made me love it more. Coach Sean? Man, I, I think – when I first started coaching, uh, 2012, 2013 at Columbia High School, um, I had Tosh. And Cold blooded. That boy was special. When you think in terms of a player of that caliber, at that level, who was that good, he was a sponge. Right. And back then, I was still getting out there playing pickup with him and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But he listened to everything. Like he listened to everything. Yes, sir. He implemented it, and I just I'm just thankful for him allowing me to be a coach. At that I was young, right? I was probably 23, 24, right? So, I mean, just seeing him go out there and compete, and I ain't gonna lie, we had most everybody that graduated, so he was coming there by himself. He carried us through. We ended up making it to the championship, but lost to a good Eagles landing team. Right. He would almost had a four in a row. Right. But. I mean, just having him and seeing him go out night in and night out and compete and basically having that like that mama mentality, like I'm going to get it done regardless, regardless of what I have, regardless of what the papers say. See, so he had all types of matchups in front of him. Um, even when, uh, what's the kid from Miller Grove? When Al-Tariq. Al when Al-Tariq Al -Tariq was a freshman. You know, of course, the, the Miller Grove, Blackthorn, I'm, not, I'm sorry, Columbia rivalry. Um, everybody was saying that he was better. And like, they were saying Al-Tariq was better as, as a freshman. freshman. And Taj as a senior. Wow. And right before we got ready to play Miller Grove, at Miller Grove, I pulled Taj to the side and I told him. I was like, you know what they said, right? He was like, nah, that freshman, he's better than you. And he was like, okay. And he went out, he had 30 and 16. 16 what? Sis. <laughs> 16 and sis. Hey, I, I I gotta piggyback on the Taj. He's I think he doesn't get his just due because of how oh, his sure. uh how his college career ended up with the injuries and stuff. But he was box office. I'm talking about I used to come home, I used to live in Canada at the time. I used to fly in to watch him play because of how he played the game. Like he was one of those dudes where he knew he could get 20, but let me go ahead and set the dinner table up for my teammates because mm -hmm. maybe they're, maybe this kid can only catch it at the rim. Maybe this kid is only a catch and shoot. Let me go ahead and get them going and get the defense off me. And he might go one quarter, he might go for 16, 18 points. And you'll look up, dude, I got a triple-double. Yeah, and sure. it's just it's kind of effortless. And I used to watch him, and I used to be like, why isn't this kid – like a McDonald's All American, why is it the you know what I mean? And at the time, I didn't understand the politics of basketball. And now that I'm in the now that I'm in the trenches, I know. Yeah. But the way they treat small guards and how they just throw small guards to the side, it's uh it's nasty. 
It's nasty how evaluators do it. <laughs> and when you got a kid that puts up the numbers and he does it the right way and he's a good kid, that has to be rewarded. Yep. And I felt like he um, didn't get his just due. And, you know, people in the cab know. People in the state know. Yeah. You know, but they're going to run to a couple other names before they go to his. And I oh, think boy. his name should be one of those names that uh, should be in that top of the list when it comes to those PGs. Yeah, in the state of Georgia, I think did he did he get Mr. Basketball? Nah, I can't remember. I, think I don't got, think he got it. I can't remember but. who they gave it to. But even with the the situation between going to school, you know, it was between Auburn and Georgia. Georgia went a different route. And so, how do you not get that type of player um, coming out of your own city, bro? Mm. The guard that school that was the same height as him. He had a good solid career. Yeah, you you know what they always say though, right? They they judge you based off your position or based what you can guard. Right. And I think that was the main thing for him was that he couldn't they felt like he couldn't guard anybody because of his size. Right, right. You know, you know what I mean? But I don't, I don't think, think that. You know, you know what I'm saying? saying? I'm, I'm thinking, thinking where, where you know, you know if, if you a ball player, player and you and make, make things happen, happen, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, matter if you, if you are, are a, a, a five, five Seven five eight guard, or you're six five six six. If you can play and you can defend and you can make your team better, then I remember CY always said one time. He said, "As long as you put that brown thing and that round thing, that's all that matters. That's all that matters, man." But you can teach a kid how to defend, yeah. Because defense ain't really about ain't really about the technique. It's about want. Like, mm -hmm. do you want to go out there and stop somebody? Now the schemes, whether it's uh, deny one pass away, gap one pass away, two passes away, you in help, or you know what I mean? Like it's th that becomes what the the system yeah. is about. But I always feel like kids from the east side, especially back then, had that competitiveness to the point where you can find probably one of the sorriest guards in DeKalb County, and I guarantee you he's still competitive. Yeah. You couldn't tell a kid that went to a lower tier DeKalb County school that. Mm -hmm. you could give him buckets. You got to show him. That's why every run that we went to, whether it be a run at a rec center or a church, that's when you see the real Hooper once they out of the system. And it's a totally different guy. But I always felt that the Cap County in the early 2000s, all the way into about 2014, 15, um, we, had the, we had the talent pool. But we also had that edge too because we were we were good enough, but we felt like they always went to the other counties first. Mm -hmm. And then when you came to the cab and you start seeing those schools not want to play us mm -hmm. because we'll play them in a, a Christmas tournament or a Thanksgiving tournament, and we end up twenty balling, thirty balling some of these teams that everybody think is the team. Then now it's like, okay, now the cab gets his recognition. Yeah. But uh yeah, I just had to I just had to speak on Taj, man, because I just felt like uh he just don't get what he deserved, bro. And I like I said, dude was you gotta go get that popcorn for for that ball tip off because you're gonna miss <laughs> something right. if you at the concession stand and Taj mm -hmm. just got that ball in his hand. Shout out to East Side, man. Man, yeah, man. Decatur, man, that's just it's <laughs> always where it's all, and it's still to this day. It's it's, it's a lot of talent. It's man. a lot of talent, man. It's, it's a, a lot, lot of talent. talent. The, the thing, man, you you just talking about like programs back when we was coming up, man. Like Stone Mountain had a really good boys program. You know what I'm saying? That's Hoopers, dog. Like you had Columbia, Southwest, Miller Grove, Latonia. You know, Latonia had some sleepers too. Stevenson. You know what I mean? Like. And That's then, the thing, and and, then, and, Dun, and uh, let's not forget back in the day because Dunwoody had some dogs too, and Juan Wilderness, and yeah. uh, what was uh, what was uh, white, yeah. white the uh, white guard they had that played with them? Uh, uh, uh Jordan Swansea, yeah, Zach Swansea, Zach Swansea. and they had Delwan go, Brown. Go get her! Yeah, they it it was some it was some talent, it was some talent spread throughout. Can't forget yeah. about Tucker either, Cam them Tucker, Cam them Manny Marshawn. So like. Jeremy, and then Simmons. when they, then when they, they added built MLK, Jihad and them boys, uh, the Bates brothers, yeah, and they built yeah. Miller Grove, 
So like, bro, we talking about you ain't even got to leave the Cap County, it was mm-hmm. over. and you gonna get some good bump. And, and that goes back to what we talked about earlier, like how so many dudes, there's so many dudes in the Cab were just in the area, but just because like it was a lot of talent and it was hard to pick through sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Or mm-hmm. some dudes are at at programs where it was a ton of dudes where they was fighting for for spots, you know what I mean? Where they were just left Tell me about it. and went somewhere else, they like, they could have been the go to guy. But you know what I mean? That just that just comes with the sacrifice with you trying to be in the right program to learn and get better as well as try to, you know, compete at a high level. And you also you didn't transfer back then unless you like really moved. You know what I mean? Like it was rare that I'm a little unhappy at Southwest. Go ahead, go over there to Stevenson, man. Cause it's a point that point guard from the graduate. Mm-hmm. I like, I love my school. Like, ain't had those I, options either, though. Yeah, ain't had them. Ain't had them options. Uh, rules were a little bit more stricter, but I think also a lot of people had more pride yeah. in where they went to school at. So Columbia didn't really rock with Southwest. Cedar Grove ain't rock with Southwest. Cedar Grove didn't rock with MLK. Miller Grove and Latonia bumped heads. Miller Grove, Redan, Redan Stevenson. So it was like everybody kind of stayed in their area because of how much pride they had at the school they mm-hmm. had. And if you went to a football game at when Columbia playing, you better be on Columbia side. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because if you if you at like let's say Avondale and Columbia play against each other, football game, and some Avondale folks go on Columbia side. At, uh, it's now called Hopper. It used to be Memorial Stadium. Yeah, bro, it's gonna be some action because yeah. everybody know everybody at Columbia. It ain't it ain't a fourteen fifteen hundred population school, mm-hmm. so everybody know who's who. So, dude, I need you to not be on this side because right. I really take pride in Move my school. From, yeah. Like same thing with Southwest. Like everybody wanted to come to our games. Cause we had a really good band, we had a really good football program, we had a really good basketball program. Um, but it was a respect thing. Like I ain't gonna disrespect Columbia. I knew I knew y'all boys from back in the day. I got love for both of y'all back in the day. But <laughs> hey, man, like you go to Columbia, dude, and y'all niggas keep yeah. kicking our ass. I can't be hanging yeah. with y'all niggas and y'all niggas going. Nah, for sure. Boy, we we kicking it, boy. Boy, hey, man, remember when beat y'all by thirty and da 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 da. But I can't be around that. Uh, nah, uh. So y'all stay over here, and I got love for y'all. When I see y'all, it's daps, it's hugs, man. How moms them doing? How mm-hmm. pops them doing? Um, but don't don't bring up that thirty ball y'all put on me, man. So yeah. you know it's the Cab County and really all of Georgia. I think they've lost that pride thing because of what the new thing is when it comes to transferring and. Um, you know, if I'm not happy, I it used to be if you weren't happy, mom and dad would be like, and get your ass in the gym and work on your game. You're really sad out here. You need you need to work on your game mm-hmm. because it ain't the coach. You just ain't producing when you get on the floor. Parents used to have that honest conversation with kids. And yeah. now it's more so like, oh, well, it's the coach's fault. Oh, y'all don't have a trainer that co- that trains for the program. Um, we gonna go over here, and yeah. we still gonna stay in the same house. But I'ma just drive an extra twenty minutes to. But when do the parents realize, and even for the kids too, when do they realize that it's not the coaches? If you're going four years of high school and you've been at three programs or, or four high schools in four years, like that's. I mean, we both we all know some kids who, in four years, they've been to more than <laughs> more than a few high schools. I coached a few. <laughs> <laughs> I coached a few. I mean, I, I just. I don't know. I think the parents nowadays they don't have realistic expectations, and that's that's big. It's like you said. So, uh, do you uh, think I'm gonna I'm ask you this? Do you think they get it by the second or third school, or they get it when they get sent home after that first year of college when they hit the portal? College. Okay. Uh, and the only reason why I say college, man, and it's just I, you know, personally. Just looking at everything, right? When you're talking about just kids and just high school, like even grassroots, right? Mm-hmm. You know, parents can pick and choose where they want to go because if their kid is one of those kids right now, they have the luxury to say, I, I can go here, I can go there, I want to do this. 
and whoever they go to sometimes or one that they they talking to, nine times out of ten is gonna be like, yeah. But the competition is, you know, you just talking about local. Right. When you're talking about going to college now, you're talking about the best kid from different states, or they was had the same accolades as that kid, all right. in one in one melt spot. Then now you can't go to the college coach and say, "My baby need X amount of minutes, or he need X amount of shots," because mm -hmm. that coach is gonna say, "You can go home. I can go find another kid just like you." You know, and I and my whole thing is that like you know I I tell a lot of my guys that go off. And just like, man, just grind. You know what I mean? Just if you have a different ap approach to like how you how you're going into everything, like just go into your first year or two, like not expecting to play much or play little, and you just grind your butt off. You know what I'm saying? Like more better results to come for you. Because one, that coach is gonna say, yo, he works, he's loyal. And if he's getting better like he's supposed to, he's gonna be out there. You know, coach like deep down, like as coaches, bro, like, just be real. I have a softer spot for the kids that really are locked in and like rocking with us because, and they do it for a long period of time mm -hmm. because I, I have a, I have a, I feel like y'all, you gave me your all and you dedicated yourself to me in the program. So when it comes down to it, I'm going to do the same thing for you as much as I can. You know what I mean? So that's what I feel like a lot of these kids and parents have to understand. Like we coaches are going to dedicate the time and energy and try to help you out as much as possible. As long as you show us the same. If you can't show us the same, then how can we do the same for you? Right. You know? Yeah. It's um, it's a tricky situation when it comes to that loyalty thing. And as a coach, you got to you gotta stand on the principles that, you know, you live by. So if you're somebody who says that they're solid and you stand on loyalty and all these other things, you got to implement that in your coaching style and your coaching philosophy. So if, why would I, why would I be give my all to this player that I know soon as I rubbed him the wrong way, they're going to transfer. But I got a kid right here. She show up every day. She work hard. She do what I ask her to do. She got good grades. Um, she ain't never in no drama. You know, those are the little things I, cause you know, I coach girls basketball, right? So, a lot of the stuff that happens off the court has to be in order before we even touch a court. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because with girls, they gonna, they gonna make it do what it do once they get on the floor if everything else off the floor is good. Mm -hmm. That's why it's this saying that um, a coach told me about girls basketball when I first joined is guys, they look good, they play good. If girls, if they feel good, they play good. So you got to tackle the emotional side of how this girl or this young woman feels before you even put a basketball in her hand. So you got to make sure that uh, you got to make sure her boyfriend didn't dump her the day of a game. <laughs> you got to make sure that, um, you know, t today's group, I, I had to get used to this, man, that the, the lip gloss. The you know the the, the eyelashes. I, my my kids, man, they want to look a certain way before they hit that floor. Yeah. And me as a guy, coaching guys, I'm like, nigga, just get out there and who? Like, yeah. But them girls, they be like, nah, Cole, my I can't be going out here looking bad. I got it. Da 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 da. da. Mm -hmm. But I always notice when they had everything in order, um, they diving on the flow. They doing this. They doing that. They yeah. talking. They competing. So um, it's – I'm always going to be loyal to the kids that's loyal to me. So if I got a kid that um, does everything I ask them, I'm going to try my best. Even if I know you can't play, I'm going to try my best to get you in school if that's what you want. You know what I mean? Sometimes kids just want to do high school and call it quits and just go to college and have fun. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm okay with that. But I, I have to – I'm obligated as a coach to do what's in the best interest for you. And I need you to understand that I'm going to make the necessary steps so you can be successful in whatever it is you want to be while you're in the program. And once you leave the program. Right. So, um, yeah, it's just with the, with the landscape of athletics in, um, in Georgia, it's, 
you kind of got to walk on eggshells, but if you stand on your principles, then everything will work itself out for you. I truly do feel that. For sure. Yeah, man. So, uh, so, so a couple more things, uh, coach, coach Mike and, and, and 10, like one, first and foremost, what do your players call you? Okay. And how do you think they perceive you? Right. So are you more of, do you think they're more of a player's coach where they come and talk to you and confide in everything or what? Or do they, you know, that's for some people with some of the girls or boys that y'all coach. Like, how's that for y'all? Bounce that off to you. I say for me, um, one, my older kids, when I first started coaching, they just called me, you know, Coach Sean. But, you know, now I'm Tenny, Coach T, Coach Tenny. But I think now my kids, once they get used to me and they realize that they can come talk to me, um, I'm more of a player's coach. And I think being a player of the game and still being able to play the game, mm -hmm. especially getting into coaching, especially with high school coaching at the time that we all got into it. Right. Um, again, we was all getting out there still playing. And so, you know, that goes a long way because with the kids, I got a coach that can do it. I saw my coach do it. You know, he just came from playing such and such, or he just, he had this route. So the things that I'm telling the kids is true. They can relate to it. So now it's like, okay, I can go talk to my coach. You know, I can tell my coach this. I can tell my coach that I'm dealing with this. I'm dealing with that. And he can give me advice and he's knowledgeable about, you know, what I'm going through and what the situation is. Yeah. Uh, 90, 98% of the kids call me Coach Mike. Mm -hmm. um, that's, I just feel like the Holloway is just too long drawn. And Coach Mike is just quick to the point. I got a couple kids that got some nicknames for me, but for the most part, it's, uh, it's, it's Coach Mike. And uh, what was the other, uh, other how, how, do they, how do your players, you think your players perceive you like more of a player's coach that they can come and confide in you or, or what, you know, what are they? Um, I'm definitely the coach that's a mixed bag. So I'm, we can have those conversations. I'm also a disciplinary because I, I, I coach up under a, a old school coach. And the first thing she always t told me was to the foundation needs to always be that they need to understand that they're kids and you're you're the adult. And once that understanding is established, then you can kind of find that relationship mm -hmm. with your players. So um, I just like I said, I'm a mixed bag like it. I've had kids that talk to me about real life situations. Mm -hmm. I've had kids that. Um, talk to me about the hoops. I've had kids that leave me alone. <laughs> um, they just don't like how I vibe, and I'm okay with that. As long as we got a mutual understanding that um, when I'm coaching you, you understand that I'm coaching you because I need you to do X, Y, and Z because it's going to help the program or benefit the program, then we cool. Like Every kid's not going to like you. Mm -hmm. right? Every kid's not going to like you, but as long as we got the respect factor yeah. and you understand that the hierarchy of I'm the coach, you're the player, um, we cool. And uh, yeah, so it's it's an interesting dynamic when it comes to having relationships with your players because uh, you just never know um, once they leave your program how much you impact them. No, and you sure. don't know until uh, they come back or you get those happy birthday texts like, Mm -hmm. You get those, hey, coach, congratulations on whatever you're doing, and this is that and the fourth. Like, those things, and I don't think kids understand, that really goes a long way because uh, we just be so focused on what's in front of us that we sometimes forget how our coaching style impacts these kids on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so it's uh, – I but I enjoy it, though. Like, I really do enjoy – um, pouring into the kids and giving them the information that they might not receive from their parents for sure, and the information that parents don't know about the game that they think they may know mm -hmm. when it comes to recruiting or how a kid is supposed to handle themselves from a professional standpoint and how you need to treat yourself like a business early in the process instead of waiting until you get to college. Yeah. 
So um, giving kids that type of um, feedback and uh, verbiage is an uh, intricate part in being a coach, and I, I really do enjoy that. So that's a part of my bag as a coach. What about you, Coach Oz? Uh And be before you go, how would you get that name? <laughs> Yo, the funny thing, dog, is a lot of people really think uh, my last name where I'm Coach Shows. Right. That, that's just a nickname that I was given back in high school. So uh, I was a senior, finished up, and uh, I had it was a couple of my teammates, man. And, you know, back then, that's when, you know, everybody didn't have a car. We did have cars, but we all rolled together. And, yeah. you know, I'm, six deep. Yeah, five, six deep, and you know I'm putting, you know, putting three or four dollars in the tank. You know, you put three or four dollars in the tank with four or five people. That's twenty, twenty five dollars. There you go. You rolling? Yeah. You, hey, listen, I'm, I, I was always big on letting people ride with me if I could get some gas money, like three or four dollars. But uh, I, I rode with a couple of my teammates, and he was like, "Man, my granddad, man, he kind of cookout. You want some?" I'm like, "Yeah, we're gonna ride through and get a barbecue. You gonna get a little plate of ribs and everything." So we all in this little Honda. I think it was a Honda Accord. You know, the Honda Accord, you know, you had to either lift the back seat up, you get out, and we send three. So I'm getting out. And he was like, oh, y'all you know, boys are fitting in like some clowns and everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, man, we just trying to roll, man. So he was like, yeah. So we started introducing ourselves. So I said, hey, how you doing, sir? I'm, I'm Lance Stores. He said, oh, Lance Shows. Man, Shows. No, 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 sir. Lance stores. Yeah, that's what I said. Lance shows. <laughs> you know, he, that's granddad. That's an older dude. You know, and, you know, back then, you know, as a younger young person, you have like I got respect for the adult, so I'm not gonna continue to correct them. Right. And just say, and I just let it ride. And so he was like, "Oh yeah, you the one I be hearing about reading about in the paper sometimes. Uh, you know, it, it's good to meet you, man. Come on here and get some ribs and a plate of uh, uh, Lance shows." And I'm talking about all my all the guys and my teammates that was with me at the time, they was laughing, just going in. And from there on out, they I just stuck with the, with the nickname Shows. Shows. So, so, you know, at the end of the day, I had to tell some people, like, man, my name is not Shows, it's Stores, but I let it ride, though, man. But uh, personally, man, me as a, as a coach, I consider myself as more of a player, like a player coach. But like, like you said, uh, 10 and Mike, like, I let it let it be known where we stand. Wow. You know what I mean? Like, you know, we can laugh and joke and we can talk about a lot of things. I'm going to give you my experiences. So you because like I, I look at life as a book, right? Like, you know, I got a certain amount of chapters on it. You do. My chapters are more than yours. So I've seen this. I've read this book before. Right. I've seen these chapters. I know what's about to come or what may come. So I'm going to try to give you a little game before you go about your business or whatever you do with sports and life. So, um, you know, I, I think we have those talks and, you know, I, I'm, I'm more of those guys. Like, I like to put a little sweat equity in too. you know, get in the gym with them, talk with them, which I know y'all do the same. You know what I mean? That's one way I kind of build a lot of good relationships with my players right. and just let them know I got them. And then too, you know how it go, man, as being an assistant, you know, you're going to hear things first before the head coach does. Nothing. And so I, I try to be that buffer, that soundboard from both parties to help you know, help that dynamic, you know, be as smooth as possible when it comes to not playing hard. You know, if a kid coming over to the sideline and I know he ain't playing hard and, you know, but the one thing is I might have said, coach, get him. But when he comes out, he's looking at the head coach. And I'm like, nah, I'm the one who told you, told coach to get you. You know what I mean? This is the reason why. Sit here for a second, breathe. Mm-hmm. Let's see the game and let's go back out there. But I, I think, you know, by being transparent and open in so many different aspects and just variety of ways, I think that's how I kind of, you know, attach myself to the kids and kind of help them in all aspects. So I, I consider myself more a player coach like y'all too as well. So, And we're going we to go ahead and wrap this thing up in a minute. But uh, you, you you had a great statement you said. It's, uh, it's going to be our segue. Um, you said something about you are the person that gets the information or you're the assistant that gets the information before the head coach, right? Yeah. So the name of this podcast is the assistance. Yes, sir. Right. And, um, we take a lot of pride in our role as being the assistant coaches to the head coach. Right. So, um, 
you know, I, I want to get you, you guys' feedback on some of the things because, you know, we don't necessarily get the credit. You know, the head coach gets the, gets the shine. But just like um, everybody knows, the person that's right next to the assist, I mean, to the head coach is really the one that kind of drives the car. So uh, what are some things, I'm going to start with you, Coach Sean, what are some things that you do on a day-to-day to help drive the program that, you coach for forward. Where do I start? For me, it's some of everything because in the program, it was really just, it was just two of us. Right. Head coach, assistant coach. Um, I mean, anything from, you know, checking on kids daily, making sure they're where they're supposed to be. And I had to stay with my kids, like as far as being a disciplinary, you got to come correct. You got to be in the right situation. You have to be doing the right things on a regular, right. not just when people are looking at you. Absolutely. Like I tell my kids that all the time. And for me, coaching boys basketball, men are measured when out of things that they're doing when nobody is watching. Right. So if you're not going to class, but you had a conversation with me or you sent me a text message saying this is what you want to do, you want to go play at this level or that level, but you're not doing what it takes to get there, how do you plan on getting there? So you have to be in the right. So just making sure I, you know, I check, pop up in on my kids and, you know, check in and see what they got going on, walk through the hallways, um, staying late, getting in the gym, actually, you know, getting out there in the workouts with them, you know, trying to make sure they get better every day. Um, you know, just that drive every day. Um, I'm also, I can't let my kids settle. A lot of kids, they'll come out and they'll want you to pat them on the back because they did something. I'm not one of those coaches. Right. I can't pat you on the back because you think it's good. Yeah, it's good, but let's get better. Right. Because there's always room for growth. Yeah. So, I mean, y'all know we take on, we wear a lot of hats, especially, you know, being in the school system too, being around the kids. You know, like you said, you got emotions here. And I feel this way. I feel that way. Um, I got this going on. I got that going on. So, I mean, it's, we take on a lot. We wear a lot of hats and we're just trying to balance them all. Absolutely. Coach Lance, what about you? What's your um what's your assistant day to day looking like um at your school? Uh I mean for the most part, man, you know, I I just try to be there where wherever, you know, big dog, you know, I call him big dog, you know, my, my coach, wherever he needs, man. You right. know, I, I go to him for the day and just be like, you know, what's on tap for today and what you what can I do to help and to make anything easy. You know what I mean? I think that's that's why we call it assistance, you know what I mean? Because you want to assist and help where you can. So, right. you know, it's the thing where, you know, I mean, of course, anything with, you know, cutting up film to player development and just like you said, just making sure the, the kids are good, man. That's the main thing. But, you know, like I said, me just going in every day, seeing what's needed to be done and, you know, just try to try to get it done, man. If it's me got to go, you know, I come to a Saturday practice or something during the season. Early in the morning, somebody's not there. Uh, how where they at? The house. All right, let me go in the car, go pick them up. We, we're gonna be a lot ten minutes late, but right. we're gonna get it going. So, just just doing whatever I had to do to be you know necessary for the program, for the betterment of the program, and just making sure that from one through fifteen on the roster is kids, and one through four or five on the coaching staff is good, and whatever they need that I can help out with, you know. So that's the main thing. Got gotcha. you. Yeah. What about you? Um, well, like I said earlier, because I, I have, I'm a part of a, um, a more experienced, I don't like to use the word old, uh, more experienced group. Uh, there's a lot of things that there may be a disconnect with, um, with the kids and how to go about it. So it could be something like social media. It can be knowing how to operate and look at film and get footage on NFHS or mm-hmm. uh huddle and stuff like that. Knowing how to cut it up so we can show offensive highlights or defensive highlights or defensive schemes or offensive schemes or whatever. So I kind of bridged that gap to help out the coaches that I I'm with, with, with those type of things. And then, you know, at the high school level on the girl side, Really, there is not a lot of attention to detail because you don't run into a lot of power five kids. Mm-hmm. So if you was to 
have a scout report and you want to scout against uh, whatever school it may be we're playing against. Most of the time, if you force everybody left, that's good enough. But I kind of brought another twist to it about, well, this kid likes to do this move. This is their go-to move. Um, when she gets jammed up in this situation, this is what she's going to do. So I kind of break down the more detailed. And I had and I learned a lot of that coaching with you guys with the Georgia Stars, watching guys' tendencies. Mm-hmm. And because, you know, guys can have so many different counters to their initial move that, you know, if a kid's really good, it's, you just got to live with the contest. It's not more so like that with girls. Once you cut off that first move and you cut off that second, you've done a really good job. And mm-hmm. there's a good chance they're going to miss unless they're one of those ones. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's getting the coaching staff to understand how to go a little bit deeper into the details of film, going to a little bit deeper into the uh, details of uh, player development. You know, that's something that I really hang my hat on a lot because that's how I got into the basketball world after I got done playing was I started off with player development. Then I became a coach. Yeah. Um, so I brought my world into their world and it meshed really well. And they just allowed me to be free and kind of just do um, what's needed because I kind of know, because I'm a little bit closer to yeah. the age of the kids I'm coaching um, than the more experienced coaches. So yeah, that's, uh, that's my day to day. That's good, man. Yeah. So we're gonna go ahead and uh we're gonna go ahead and get up out of here real quick. Uh the assistant podcast, uh Coach Lance, let let everybody know what high school um uh you, you're North, at. North Cross High School, man. Yeah, North Cross High School and um what are some other things that you have going on in the basketball world that people need to know about? Uh I mean just me really just, you know, just person with any kids that I, I have known or encountered with, like I just kind of try to help them out as much as possible with, you know, what they need to do for wise, you know, schooling or just decisions if they need help with that. You know what I mean? It's just more so just a guy. Like I said, that, that's what I, that's what I'm here to do and what I want to do. And then also, um, you know, since I coached Anthony Edwards back in high school, you know, I've been allowed to kind of to be on the, on the, you know, program advisor side of just kind of helping out over there, you know, just some, different things here and there, you know, right. which has been really, really good, man. There's some good dudes over there, good kids. So, like I said, I'm in a good space, and I'm enjoying what I'm doing. Awesome. And, Coach Sean, what's, uh, let's get some feedback and some information on what you got going on. Uh, this year, making a transition from Latonia High School. Shout out Coach Marion um, on the east side um, in Gwinnett County now at Archer High School. Um, Coach Stroud, so, you know, joining a new staff. Um, it's a new situation, new environment. Everything's a little bit different, you know, transitioning. So just getting used to it, you know, getting my feet wet with that over there and, you know, ready to have a good year. Yeah, man. And um, I'm at uh, I'm at Southwest Cab High School, uh, my alma mater. And uh, this will be going into my f- fifth year, uh, varsity assistant coach. So. You know, and then I also have my own uh, basketball company, Drill Work Training, uh, where we, you know, we do player development, skill development, and uh, life development um, from all ages. So uh, that's uh, that's that's the motion that I got going on. So we're going to dive in next episode. We're going to really tap into this high school conversation and yes, kind of really, you know, we're going to. We got to talk about who's who and who we need to look forward to. All right. So, you know, yes, fellas, I appreciate y'all, man. You know, we finally got up out of the group chat. <laughs> we finally got out of the group it, chat. <laughs> it, took, it took years, but, you know, we finally here. And I think, you know, I think what we've got to provide for the game is what's needed. You know yeah. what I mean? So, you know, I appreciate y'all I, coming I, out. And I also just appreciate you uh, forcing us to do it, Coach Mike. You know, you you the one who said it, wanted to do it, and – you know, we finally got to do it. So appreciate you, brother. Hey, man, let's let's make this thing. Uh, let's make this thing an everyday thing. Yes, sir. All right. All this, right. The assistance. We out. Out.